2025 Annual General Conference of the Ghana Bar Association, which has been held in the Great Hall of the Family Primary University of Science and Technology, under the theme Fair and Transparent Elections, the key to sustainable democracy. And now we have the integrated council. It is made up of 25 districts, 17 municipals, and one metropolis. It has a literacy rate of 79.6%. So the erroneous impression of the RML is really <laughs> There are three public universities, namely Barbara Bruma University of Science and Technology, which has a law faculty under the College of Humanities and also houses the Kumasi Campus of the Ghana School of Law. Kumasi Technical University and Akinten Apia Menka University of Skills, Training and Entrepreneurial Development and other 18 private institutions. So it tells you about the literacy in India. The region also has the highest number of senior high schools with the St. Jude Secondary School case, being the first to be established in July 1973, which was formerly known as the Ashanti Collegiate by J.T. Robert. Undoubtedly, the best and most popular senior high school, that's my alma mater, and that is also where His Majesty himself comes from. Mr. Bob, I didn't mention Prince because he's a college. <laughs> in the year 2015, the National Conference was held in this same venue, and members had a memorable event. We are promising to make this year a better one. And it started yesterday. We were coming. Ashanti Region has over the years played and continue to play a significant role in the social, cultural, and economic development of our dear nation. The region is a major contributor to Ghana export trade from time immemorial with products like gold, gold timber, handicrafts, and African prints, particularly the famous KJ Club, which has achieved worldwide recognition. And this morning, our Ghana has demonstrated that. It is indeed the home of unadulterated culture and the cultural hub of the nation. The Ghana's rich cultural heritage is best depicted in the region. It is said that His Royal Majesty, the two four, sent to the second as a alone, is a whole cultural phenomenon and tourism industry. <laughs> And we, we saw what happened in Cape Coast. It was something that I cannot relate The city has almost achieved a, a cosmopolitan status and a transit point for various visitors. And I dare say that the region has also become a universe because we have some countries within the region. And I can mention a few. In Atosu, we have Atosu, Kuwait. <laughs> if you go to Gokro, we have Gokro, South Africa. <laughs> and at Bremen, we have Bremen, New York. Yes, you mentioned it. The city commands an appreciable nightlife with popular Bantma High Street, Kufu, Amekum, Asafu, Patasi High Street, where you can enjoy the life that you can enjoy yourself with the lives never go out. I don't want to mention that political name. So. <laughs> Local dishes, notably fufu with assorted soup, with popular abnubu are available in the city and its environment, in their natural taste and flavor. Your comfort as a guest in the evenings is assured. During this conference, you will do everything possible to make your stay safe and enjoyable and very secure. While in the region, please take advantage to visit the Manchia Palace Museum to see for yourself the return of the 32 items, crown jewels, that the Asante gold artifacts that were looted by the British. Center for Natural Culture, the Lake Bosumpi, Kwabri, Triangular, the Shana Club Village, Mutonso, the Incredible Lady Towns, the Kedetia Market. You know, we have Kedetia Dubai.
And those who did not benefit of flying to the city, we now have our premier the first international airport. And very soon, very soon, we believe that the sea will come and we have our house. around and you have more energy, we have given you opportunity and you have a liberty to spend the rest of the night with the legal starlets at the special sessions at the respective nightclubs to do the clubbing. Please do experience the warm hospitality and the friendliness of the enterprising people of the home of Asante Kingdom. To give us his address, shall we welcome him? Right. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, the President of the Republic of Ghana, Your Royal Majesty Otunfo Osei Tutu II, the Chief Justice. Men and women who belong to the learned profession, colleague ministers of state here present, MMDCs, members of the security agencies, Nananum, distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's very heartwarming to join you this morning at this bar conference at PNUST here in Kumasi in the Ashanti region. Actually, I'm going to say some few words because when my boss is around, in reality, apart from welcome address, I need not to talk much. For this government, what I'll say which is headed by His Excellency Nana Dutankwe Kufuado, with the support of his, the Vice President, His Excellency Dr. Alagi Mahmoud Baumia, especially in the Ashanti region, the government has done a lot for the judiciary, especially in terms of infrastructure, that is accommodation, and court buildings. Now, fortunately for me, I have the President and His Excellency and the Royal Majesty here to confirm what I'm going to say. Both of them cut the sword for the construction of the Appeals Court Judges Residential Complex, which has more than Accommodation of 20 separate units with a tennis court, swimming pool, and a place where they can relax during the night and when they are free. Besides the appeals court judges residential complex, this government led by His Excellency Leonardo Danque Kufado has constructed 24 court buildings fully finished in the Ashanti region. I know. Additionally, he is constructed, apart from the peaceful residential complex, 22 accommodation buildings for the judiciary all fully finished. I'm not surprised with the performance of the president when it comes to the area of the judicial service. First, because he himself is a lawyer, 
and he is a pure democrat who understands and appreciates the foundation of the basis of democracy, democratic practices. He knows that democracy, we have the foundation as the rule of law. And you cannot have proper rule of law without having a very fair, well-resourced, motivated judicial system. And as a president who knows exactly what he's doing in a democratic country, has done all his best to provide the needed infrastructure for the judiciary. Across the country, he's constructed more than 100 court buildings. <laughs> the president, let me take this opportunity to express my appreciation to you and to two for because in most of these infrastructure developments, either both of you or one of you is there to cut the sword or do the commission. Ashanti region is grateful to you, Ghana is grateful to you. I wish you a successful Congress. Thank you very much. One who and Accra for secession, and I know we wish for secession. Fortunately, most of the accused have so far been convicted. Illegal mining, that I'm saying, continues to cause incalculable damage to our forest reserves and water bodies. In the teeth of the difficulties hospitals encounter in the courts, in the prosecution of illegal mining offenses, the criminal division has enjoyed some success, even though there is still room for more to be done. From August 2021, to date, at least 76 persons, including 18 foreigners, have been convicted. They include the acclaimed Chinese Gelang Sikwe, who was convicted on 4th of December 2023 of offenses committed between 2014 and 2016 in the era of the previous government. Most of the convicts were sentenced under the new law at 995 to a minimum of 15 years plus a hefty fine for a non -gale. Currently, we have around 40, minimum of 15 years plus a heavy fine in the case of a Ghanaian, and a minimum of 20 years plus a fine for a non for a Ghanaian. For a non I'm sorry. Currently, over 140 cases of illegal mining involving over 850 accused persons have been prosecuted in courts in the western, eastern, Ashanti, greater, and upper east regions of Ghana. Some are near conclusion. The unsigned heroes from the Office of Attorney General are the city drafting division. They are that army of well disciplined, properly trained, meticulous lawyers whose task it is to set the city framework for all we do. Without them, none of the three arms of government can function. The city drafting division has been responsible for carrying my vision of law reform in both civil and criminal aspects of the law. They have paid great attention to the public policy of the law and have drafted the law about 60 acts of parliament and innumerable subsidiary legislation since 2021. Whilst based on record, the human's effort to reveal the business of the Office of the Attorney General and Minister of Justice, which have kept the nation safe and sound, we cannot ignore the hitherto deplorable conditions in which these attorneys work. My visit to the head offices of various agencies under the Ministry of Justice revealed hugely undesirable working conditions and the lack of basic tools for service to the nation. In a few situations where I consider the decision patently wrong and perverse to our legal system, I have resorted to processes for a correction of same through review or an appellate procedure. Judges must also understand that they are not enemies of the people or indeed of the government. The role of a judge is not only to restrain abuse of power, but also uphold the work of government when it acts within its powers or is on the right path. Our judiciary must embrace the concept of open justice by publishing and explaining decisions and by allowing access to the courts in person and in true broadcast in very important matters. It is for this reason that I'm proud to state that as Attorney General, I've led in this quest of ensuring open justice in Ghana as a way of dispelling misconceptions, misinterpretations, and misinterpretations of court decisions. 
by making a formal application, and indeed two formal applications to the justice for live broadcasts of particular court proceedings of overwhelming public interest. In point of fact, the first time there was live broadcast of proceedings in court in a case other than the presidential election petition was this year, first one to my application, and it happened in the kind of operation of the Chief Justice, Saki Tokuno. And it is worthy to note that the United States, United States Supreme Court does not even allow complete live broadcast of proceedings. We must therefore appreciate our progress in this regard. As I resume my seat, and I think at this time it is also appropriate, it is appropriate to, to wish a little bit to the justice happy birthday in advance. Happy the second birthday in advance. Yeah. I'm aware she's going to Malaysia, the roses will come in Malaysia. As I resume my seat, I must emphasize the need for a strong bar as a partner for nation building. A fragmented bar is not in the interest of the bar itself. Neither is it for society. We must have one strong bar association. We must make the processes for fiscal participation of all lawyers in the annual bar conference flexible. I'm aware that some lawyers attempted to register a week or two ago, but were not permitted to do so. They thus cannot vote or make their voices heard in important decisions. This situation cannot be right. We are still a small family. Our processes must be such as to encourage participation of all. Else, a time will come when lawyers will find it cumbersome or tedious attending the bar conference and participating in court. These the days when lawyers could show up in the morning of conference, register, and be allowed to participate in the conference. And it does not present any security concerns at all. Indeed, we must find a way to change. I'm aware that this case is an year. We are the opportunity to wish all the candidates the very best and may the best candidates win. God bless us all. Thank you. President, Nana Adodankwa Ekufuado, Your Royal Majesty, Otunfo Osai Tutu II, King of the Ashanti Kingdom, Nana Nom and Nana Hima here in present, the Vice Chancellor, Members of the Council of State, Honorable Godfrey Diego Adami, Attorney General and Minister of Justice, the Regional Minister of Ashanti Region, Honorable Simon Osei Mensa, Honorable Ministers, Deputy Ministers, Members of Parliament present, MMDCs, Heads of Security Agencies, my Lords of the Superior Courts, Eminent Clergy, Law Deans, Director of Legal Education, National and Regional Executives of the Ghana Bar Association, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen, Good morning. I am greatly delighted. Oh, my husband reminded me this morning to acknowledge him. Mr. Francis Tokono. I'm really delighted to join you this morning to open the annual conference of the Ghana Bar Association. The lineup of conference activities spanning spiritual dedication, intellectual discourses, and learning sessions, sporting activities, deliberations on emotionally disturbing issues, and the usual dancing sessions that remain unequal in exhilaration, and which I miss very much from bar, <laughs> from bar conferences, reflects the buoyant strength of the Ghana bar Clearly, the Ghana Bar Association continues to grow from strength to strength. To the executive, thank you for keeping the torch of excellence high. The 2023-2024 legal year was a mountaintop experience for me, following the passage of the responsibility of Chief Justice to me in June 2023. Assuredly, 
God has been with me through this first year in office. I have experienced the grace of good health, sound mind, and the cooperation of the executive, the legislature, the judiciary, the bar, and the good people of Ghana. I am extremely grateful and can only say it in what must be two of the most impactful yet simplest words known to human vocabulary. Thank you. The Rules of Court Committee has worked on amendments to the High Court Civil Procedure Rules CI 47 2004 to introduce dedicated rules on the resolution of parliamentary elections. All stakeholders in justice administration work together to increase the culture of legality, ethical conduct, and development of critical infrastructure such as digital tools for the mandate entrusted in justice delivery, we shall achieve the efficiency and just outcomes that the nation deserves. Although all personnel that support the justice delivery function of the judiciary are experts in different fields, more than 99% of our supporting directory, officers and staff do not have the requisite training on consideration of what affects legality, due process, and validity of court processes and proceedings and legal departments of other institutions. It is from this perspective that apart from resolutely leading the development of manuals, guides, and directions for court processes and proceedings, I also set the Judicial Training Institute the task of producing curriculum for paralegal training of all judicial service staff. The first batch of this material is ready for use and we are preparing more faculty members to assist in delivering consistent training for all our 7,000 plus staff of lawyers that are referred to the disciplinary committee of the General Legal Council for unethical practices against their clients. The General Legal Council is actively working, engaging the Council of Law Deeds concerning the mainstreaming of the study of legal ethics at the faculty level. There seems to be an untoward motion that the law is a root to becoming rich early. However, Chancellor of this great university, Her Ladyship Gertrude Araba Isaba Sakitoko, Chief Justice of the Republic of Ghana, accompanied by the most romantic spouse in the country, Mr. Francis since the Chief Justice wants peace at home, we support her in that. <laughs> Honorable Joseph Oseusu, Deputy Speaker of the Parliament of Ghana, my Lords Justices of the Supreme Court and other Superior Courts of Dedicator, the Right Honorable Godfrey Yebu Adami, Attorney General and Minister of Justice, Ministers of State, Honorable Simon Osei Mensa, Ashanti Regional Minister, Honorable Alfred Tiyayapo, Deputy Attorney General and Minister of Justice. Honorable Diana Asunaba Dapatri for Deputy Attorney General and Minister of Justice. Professor Rita Akusia Dixon, Vice Chancellor, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Professor Ellis Dabo, Pro Vice Chancellor. Honorable Sam Pine, Mayor of Kumasi and other MMDCs. Nana Nung, Nana Jakume Difi, Mamponhima, and other Queen Mothers. Members of the National Executive Committee and General Council of the Bar, better friends, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. One does not need to have the foresight of a Hebrew prophet to know that this is my valedictory conference address. There ever was a fairy tale ending to a story of a journey of the bar leadership, it certainly would be mine. For it was in this city of my birth, the Jerusalem of the Republic of Ghana. And at this same venue in September 2015, 
that I address conference for the first time in my capacity as Ashanti Regional President and deliver a welcome address for conference that without intending to sound boastful is generally considered to be the best ever. <laughs> the memories of that conference have lived with members who were present forever. Today, I deliver my final address to conference as national president in the same city and at the same venue. And I can say thank you to the good Lord for how far he has brought me. Unfolding before your very eyes, my levels don't change. <laughs> Let me take this earliest opportunity to say a power and warm welcome to all your distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen to the beautiful city of Kumasi, the proud city of this year's Black Conference. And we know that by the time we say 98, you forever remember this week. As far as welcomes are concerned, I must mention His Excellency the President of the Republic in a very special way. He was the first Attorney General under the Fourth Republic to attend the whole session of the Ghana Association Conference. He was the first Attorney General to pay for state attorneys to attend conferences. A welcome practice to <laughs> participate. As Foreign Minister, he attended the opening ceremony of every bar conference. As his party's flag bearer, he again attended the opening ceremony of every bar conference. On assumption of the High Office of President of the Republic, he has attended the opening ceremony of every bar conference, and today he makes his state appearance. <laughs> the GBA is suggesting to you that it is possible for you to personally break your age, so that when you complete your position mandated term as President of the Republic and retire from high office, you will still be attending bar conferences. <laughs> for as long as the good Lord allows you, Mr. President, the GD assures you of its utmost gratitude for your unflinching commitment to our values, interests, and our cause. Otunfo Osei Tutu Asante Hine is going to a title to a special welcome. On 26 April 1999, Otunfo was installed as the 16th Asante Hine. It came to pass that a few months into his reign, the GBA annual conference was held in Kumase from Sunday 26 September 1999 to Thursday 30 September 1999. Otunfo accepted the invitation as a special guest of honor, and as usual, delivered a riveting speech at the opening ceremony on Monday, 27 September 1999. Of all the qualities lawyers are known for, it could be said that clairvoyance is not one of them. However, the GBA leaders at the time must certainly be clairvoyant. When they conferred an honorary membership of the Ghana Basis on the Santegne, and the reign of the Santegne has been nothing short of spectacular. In 2008, Dasantini under the GBA and hosted a store black tie in at Mechia Palace. He repeated it in 2015. It has now become the main attraction for conferences held in Kumasi. This evening, Dasantini once again hosts another black tie dinner. Unfortunately, because of our numbers, only 700 of us have been invited to attend the event. <laughs> we can safely say that Dasantini has discharged all his obligations to the GBA. He has fully paid in kind his brother-in-law, Katlas, Akuntasekai. <laughs> we deem it a blessing and very significant that in the Silver Jubilee year, that Santegne has found time to be us. That makes us special. That Santegne is definitely one of us. Utunfo, Yedawase. I wish to also express my profound gratitude to the indefatigable members of the Council of the Ghana Bar Association, the executives of the Ashanti Regional Bar Association, and others who have tirelessly assisted and cooperated to make this year's conference a reality and hopefully a success. I also deem it fit and needful to special acknowledge and thank the Vice Chancellor and Council of this great university for opening their doors to us and putting their facilities at our disposal at this conference. We are grateful. So, we are happy to be back to Kumasi. Our special gratitude goes to the traditional municipal authorities and indeed to the good people in Kumasi for hosting us. 
I've, heard, I've overheard a lot of residents say in my rounds, lawyer for Wukru. <laughs> this should not be surprising, as there is no place in Ghana that has a history of the struggle for the civil liberties that Kumasi, Amadou Baba, Mohamed Ladan, Bafwa Kutu, who are known to every student of constitutional law, were all residents of Ashanti Jutan. It is therefore not surprising that our own Anna Ej Bafwa has agreed to sponsor a trip to Menshia South for interested members to visit the homes of Amadou Baba, Mohamed Ladan, and Bafwa Akutu. This year's conference is on the theme, I, I remember mine, not the, the secretary for Russia's. <laughs> Peaceful, free, fair, and transparent elections, the key to sustainable democracy. Clap for me that I remember the master. <laughs> the choice of this team could not have been accidental. For a nation and its people that are preparing for another general elections in about 89 days from today, I believe that the theme of the conference is very appropriate and comes at an opportune time. There are undoubted backgrounds and antecedents to what exists to come in December that serve as good basis for introspection and perspectives within our unique recent history. Ghana last year celebrated 30 years of constitutional rule under the 1992 Constitution, with a precursor to that observation of 7 January as a public holiday since 2019. It is instructive to acknowledge that the 1992 Constitution is the fourth one in the history of Ghana since our independence in 1957. Since the inception of the 1922 Constitution, Ghana has gone on to enjoy undoubtedly its longest uninterrupted constitutional rule, surpassing the six years uninterrupted rule under the 1960 Republican Constitution. The establishment of constitutional rule in Ghana under the ages of the Constitution, following its approval in a referendum in April 1992, did not come on a silver platter. Its antecedents do not only reveal sacrifices and struggles by the citizens and civil society organizations that, but were tumultuous, bloody, and despondent. Constitutional and democracy under the Constitution have guaranteed the right of Ghanaians to vote and be voted for under Article 42 of the Constitution. That has immeasurably and undoubtedly ensured an enhanced participatory democracy in Ghana in the last three decades. Ghana has so far had eight different general elections since 1992, and ninth one is under three months away. It is not in doubt that the stakes are even higher, and that is expressed in some of the public commentaries of leading figures of the two main political parties in this country, some of which have been most inappropriate and irresponsible. These pronouncements have been met with the fitting criticisms and condemnation, and the justifications or attempted rationalization by their proponents and underlings have been unconvincing to say the least. Inherent in those criticism and commendations is a realization that such utterances and political rhetoric are incendiary that could stop needless agitations, unrest and conflicts that could ultimately destabilize our democratic gains and electoral processes. Our political leaders and their highlights, who appear on campaign platforms and in the media, are called upon to be measured and circumspect in their utterances and actions so as not to hurt and jeopardize our peace, progress, and stability. The importance, utility, and opportunities of democratic rule, with all these in incidents, including regular national elections under the Constitution, cannot be overemphasized. I am not saying all has been lofty and sincerely, but it has at least given Ghana some relative peace and political stability. We dare not, we dare not take this for granted. Let us spare a moment to look around us even in the sub-region. It is said that Ghana is an oasis of peace in a rather troubled and turbulent sub-region. Most of the countries in West Africa and around have tasted and have been involved in one form or the other of military adventurism in the last few years. For the fact that there has been uninterrupted and sustained political stability in the last 30 years without any military intervention or coup, showing democratic consolidation never seen in the history of Ghana post-independence, is a testament to the path of constitutional rule we have chosen as a people. Recently, a professor with a think tank in Accra posited rather disturbingly that Ghana's democracy is under threat if some stated concerns of the pending elections turn violent are not addressed. He had also alleged that the Ghana armed forces were ready to intervene should the elections in the country turn violent beyond the control of the Ghana police service. 
A rather swift rejoinder by the Ghana Armed Forces through his head of public relations, Brigadier General Adil Kwashi, saying that the Ghana Armed Forces had no intention to stage a coup and would even prevent and resist any individual, group or organization seeking to take over unlawfully the power of government, either acting alone or in collaboration with any security agency, was most reassuring and commendable. That statement from the Ghana Armed Forces was only consistent with the duty of all of us to respect and protect the 1992 Constitution for resolution of grievances by due process of the law, especially through court processes. A resort to violence has never been a veritable option in civilized democracies. We must all appreciate that an imperfect constitutional democracy that gives the opportunity to citizens to either periodically change governments or extend their mandate is a far better option than any form of military adventurism where our lives and opportunities will be at the homes and caprices of some lawless few throw back to our past days of shame. However, that should not also make us feel and act complacent. Despite our relative democratic gains and electoral successes since 1992, the obvious truth is that we pale in comparison to established democracies such as the USA and the UK. We should not act like the anecdotal young man who manages to travel to the USA or the UK and returns to Ghana with a fake English accent and missed delusions from Ghana. That is why the upcoming general elections are crucial, serving another little test of our democratic credentials. The eyes of the African continent and the rest of the world will be firmly gazed on Ghana. They'll be looking to see if we have the metal and desire to handle our differences and continue the path of democratic consolidation as the surest way to guarantee sustainable democracy. Let us prove that democracy has found a home in Ghana and that we should not go back. A lot more will be expected of us during our elections to elect a new president and other executives to spare the affairs of the association in the next three years. Whatever has been said about the conditions that must exist to ensure a peaceful, free, and transparent elections equally apply to our upcoming elections as a microcosm of what is to come on December 7 in the general election. As usual, Ghanaians will be looking to the GBA for leadership as the general election approaches. Incidentally, in a few days' time, we'll be voting in our own elections to select executives who will steer the affairs for the GBA for the next three years. How do we show leadership in these times? It is the noise of silence, the, the noise of silence, the power of our example. We can only look to the nation and acquire the legitimacy to speak truth to politicians if our own example allows us to do so. Have we conducted ourselves, our campaigns, and our collective conduct leading to our elections? How have we conducted ourselves, our campaigns, and our collective conduct leading to our elections? Simply put, have we come to equity with clean hands? It is rather unfortunate that our conduct and campaign leaves much to be desired. We hear of partisan alignments, monetary inducements, the trolley post on WhatsApp platforms, outlandish promises that cannot be possible within the provisions of the GBA constitution. Unfortunately, some of these unsavory matters have found its way to the mass media. It should be of great concern to every well meaning member of the GBA. The GBA is a noble association of learned persons, and there is no place in the association for such conduct, which may be permissible in the realm of partisan politics. We lose our voice if we also behave like politicians. We must understand this basic principle. The GBA leads, the GBA does not follow. The registration of voters and conduct of general elections in Ghana is constitutionally mandated in the Electoral Commission under Article 46 of the Constitution. While these parties slug it out and execute their plans and factors as securing electoral victory, and which we believe shall be, shall be within the law, the law requires the EC not to be complacent, but to put their acts together to once again deliver on their mandate to deliver the tr tr a truly credible, transparent, fair, and world-class elections. That would mean that before, during, and after the general elections, the actions and declaration by the Electoral Commission and its chairperson, her deputies and other commissioners should inspire confidence in the electoral process, leading to an outcome that would have credibility 
and wide acceptance. To ensure a peaceful society as key to sustainable democracy, there is one useful tool that I believe can help us achieve with the rise in political tension. It is called dialogue. Dialogue is ubiquitous all around us, at home, between siblings about who should do the chores, at the office about the manager and employee considered the best way to achieve corporate goals, and across the political plane in governance as to what constitutes priority setters for allocation of scarce resources. It is crucial for democracy as it ensures diverse perspectives are considered in decision-making processes. By way of a necessary disclosure, I am an unashamed proponent of dialogue. My extensive lived experience from working with different persons and situations, come from home, work, environment, and professional practice, has continually reinforced my belief in dialogue. Upon assumption of office as the president of the Ghana Bar Association, I set out to pursue dialogue, both internally, especially in my engagements with other executive and council members, and in external relations with other institutions and leaders. It was in that spirit why I led delegations of the GB to pay courtesy calls and interact with the two chiefs of the defense staff who have been in office during my tenure, Vice Admiral Seth Amwama and Lieutenant General Thomas Opompipra, and the Inspector General of Police, Dr. George Nekufu Dampare. It is in that same spirit why, by my position as a bar president, I have rather used constitutional and statutory structures of avenues, such as the Judicial Council, General Legal Council, and occasional and audiences with the interactions and audiences with the President, the Attorney General, and persons in authority to deliberate and dialogue on matters of national interest instead of running to the media. Unfortunately, this position has led to all manner of accusations and misconceptions against me. It has increased the decibel levels of accusation that the bar has lost its voice. That is not so. In a democracy, activism is intellectual, not militant, especially in this era of heated and oftentimes unnecessary and unhealthy discourse. As I stated earlier, my lived experiences are the basis of my fundamental conviction that dialogue is always the best solution as opposed to bandstorming and hubris. Dialogue is for the brief. It is a soothing balm and a panacea. I am the only national president whose father was once the national secretary of the Ghana Bar Association. My father, Honorable S.K. Boafo, held that position from 1982 to 1985 during the presidency of the legendary J. Kajima. My uncle, Kwame Boafo, was called to the bar in 1980. As a teenager, I knew there was a yearly ritual where my father and my uncle would pack their bags to attend something called a bar conference for some days. For me, it was a happy moment, as I will escape my father's overarching and proving discipline. <laughs> However, for my paternal grandmother, the late Mrs. Mary Chumis Wagwafo, it meant something else. During that period, she would be sober, praying in all manner of tongues and ensconced in her bedroom. For me, it was my grandmother engaging her melodramatic theatrics. After some days, the better sound of the horn of my father's Peugeot 504 will sound, heralding the arrival of my father and my uncle. My happy days will be over. My grandmother will burst in jubilation, thanking God for the arrival of his sons. <laughs> it was when I became a father of adult sons that I now appreciated the agony of my grandmother. Her sons had traveled and their safety wasn't guaranteed. Unknown to me, she had feared for their lives, for their lives while praying for their safe arrival. That was a lot of lawyers, Uncle Sam is here, who attended bar conferences in those days. I shudder to think of how I would feel if my two adult sons, Pedro Daddy and Marcus, decide to attend an event where their safety is not guaranteed. In my junior lawyer days, my father shared an experience that has had a profound effect on me. Past President J. K. Jemain, my father attended an IBA conference in the United States and made a presentation on the delivery of justice by the public tribunals. Naturally and also surprisingly, as informed by the turbulent environment at that time, the presentation was critical of the public tribunal system. That presentation led to a 10-month exile for J.K. Ajman in Nigeria and my father in the UK. These harrowing experiences all happened under the military regime. At times, the unintended consequences of unbridled militant agitations, whether in way or in deed, create conditions for military adventurers to take over. There is no way the powerful voice of the GPA should be part of such unintended consequences. 
As President Barack Obama stated, the fact that you have the biggest hammer does not mean every problem is a nail. There is a need for a constant remember that our voice exceeds the voice of any professional body and it must be handled with great care. The bar must always be a voice of reason amidst cacophony of vile noises and irresponsible comments made in the public space. The GBA must always strive to be an island of sanity within an ocean of madness. As a gentle reminder, I charged the Executive Secretary when I took office to look for the photographs of all past presidents of the GBA to be framed and hung at the remodeled conference room at the National Secretariat. Some people thought I was engaging in some aesthetic vain glory. Certainly not. It is intended to be a permanent reminder to the leadership of the bar of our history, purpose, and prestige. From R.S. Blade to Anthony Forces, lies a history unblemished and unparalleled, and any bar leader would then understand the essence of the office he holds. I do not do this because I have been compromised and influenced by outside influences or partisan loyalties. I do so because I believe it is the right thing to do. Does that mean that the GBA must keep mute and stand idly by when grave injustices are unfolding behind our eyes? We can't do that. The GBA must go beyond public statements. The GBA should mediate, commence public interest litigation in course of competent jurisdiction, and issue professional opinions on matters of national interest. In my humble, humble opinion, merely issuing public statements that may only be broadcast if a media house decides to do so, and not doing anything else is not enough. Sometimes I do so not only because I believe that it's more constructive and effective, but I also find that the smacks of betrayal and bad faith with an attendant effect of creating suspicions and mistrust in future engagements when after deliberations I come to the media. It must be put on record that twice a year, the President of the Republic grants access to the GD to deliberate on matters affecting the nation. These discussions held behind closed doors are frank yet cordial, and the GD hopes the next President of the Republic, irrespective of his political party, continues with such engagements. The Speaker of Parliament, Honorable Alban Sumara Kings from Biden, has also since his election as Speaker, met the leadership of the GBA every year and always invites us to send representation and comments to Parliament on very important matters of state. I want to reiterate that the GBA has never, is not, and shall never be an appendage of any political party. <laughs> never happened. It is not happening, and we must ensure that it never happens in the future. As lawyers, it is part of our training and practice to promote dialogue. The effective use of dialogue to resolve disputes is expressed through means such as mediation and negotiation. Many a lawyer can attest to the effectiveness and utility of dialogues between parties in resolving otherwise complicated and thorny issues between parties. Yet again, dialogue in its pristine form was evident in our country, in the work of the community of Committee of Eminent Chiefs, head, headed by the Asante men, appointed to mediate and resolve the protracted, protracted Dagon crisis dispute of many years. The Eminent Chiefs finally succeeded to resolve the chieftain's dispute, mainly through dialogue, which culminated in the solution of a new Yana for Dagon. The above examples serve as a good reason and template for dialogue to be replicated and promoted in our country, especially in an election year such as this. It is why I believe many Ghanaians find it refreshing, commendable and positive that the National Democratic Congress at the beginning of this year returned to the Interparty Advisory Committee after a three-year absence over electoral concerns following the 2020 general elections. From the grassroots through to the electoral areas and at the consistent level to the national level, People and electorates should embrace and use dialogue in resolving disputes instead of taking to arms and engaging in violence. The GBA urges the Electoral Commission and our political parties to use dialogue in resolving any difference of concerns. Through that, grievances will be better addressed, valuable feedback given, and electoral processes more streamlined, which will go a long way to ensure transparency, credibility, 
and acceptance of electoral processes and outcomes, and by extension, deepening the sustainable democracy and peace, peaceful coexistence in our country. To our brothers and sisters in the media space, please beware of the season. Everything should not be about and be reduced to monetization, sensationalism, and getting traffic to your stations and platforms. The Ghanab Association joins the calls for more responsibility, decency, restraint, and circumspection on our airwaves and on the other media outlets, especially in this election year. The media and the programs they produce and publish should be healthy ones that promote peaceful coexistence and offering real talk shop and marketplace of ideas where opinions and superior alternatives are discussed and exchanged within an atmosphere of civility, rather than platforms used as outlets of ventilation of divisions, intemperate language, and beating of war ground. While the upcoming general elections and their related matters remain paramount, they should not take our minds from other equally important matters that have, that have replayed effects on how we effectively achieve, achieve sustainable democracy and indeed affect our very existence as a people. For example, corruption is still persistent through embezzlement, bribery and misappropriation and plain stealing of public funds and even in case of conflict of interest. There appears to be unanimity on the ubiquity of corrupt practices within the public sector and among the general population that has had deleterious effects on growth and development. It is considered that corruption, irrespective of its form, shape and color, affects the economy and further impoverishes the poor and poses an essential threat to democratic governance. Since 1992, various and successive governments have implemented initiatives and policies and programs to deal with and curb corruption in Ghana. However, the current reality is that corruption is still a very big problem that hinders Ghana's development and its quest to consolidate constitutional rule. The revelations from the Citizens of Public Accounts Committee of Parliament and the Auditor General's reports are not only staggering but made us make a sad commentary on the state of corruption in Ghana. In the latest Global Corruption Perception Index report released by Transparency International on 30 January 2024, Ghana scored 43 out of a clean score of 100 and ranked 70th out of 180 countries and territories included in the Corruption Perception in the CPI. According to the said report, that marks the fourth consecutive year of stagnation in Ghana's anti-corruption efforts as indicated by the CPI. While the GB accepts that the attribution of Ghana's stagnation on the CPI to the deteriorating justice system, which it says is reducing the accountability of public officials and therefore allowing corruption to thrive, is contestable and may not be wholly accurate. And while the GB acknowledges the works and efforts of state institutions such as the judiciary, the office of the attorney general, the office of the special prosecutor and trap to deal with corruption and corruption-related matters, nonetheless, it still paints a grim picture of the state of corruption and its fight in Ghana. In other words, we can do better and must be doing better in fighting the this counter. The GDA calls for increased allocation of funds to resource the new constitutional and statutory bodies to fight corruption and for Ghanaians to generally demonstrate more integrity with their dealings with one another. The GDA is aware that the conduct of public officers' bill has taken some time to be passed by Parliament into law. There has been an inordinate delay we believe that this bill, when passed into law, will be very key in ensuring high standards and integrity and accountability in public office, and by extension, reducing corruption-related acts, especially within the public sector. We, work, we urge the executive and the legislature to work together with more agency in ensuring that this bill is passed into law before the expiration of the current government. In the lifetime of the current parliament, as assured by my very best friend, Mr. Alfred Tiaipoa, a Deputy Attorney General, last year. His Excellency, the President of the Republic, at last year's annual general conference of the GBA, gave a firm assurance that a law on the conduct of public officers was in the offing. One year down the line, we didn't believe that it is fit and appropriate to ask for specific answers from His Excellency and his government regarding timelines and the roadmap. There is also the issue of the unhealthy monetization of our elections and lack of transparency in the funding of political parties, especially during election years. Suffice it to say that the monetization of our politics and elections is now commonplace. The natural consequences of monetization of our politics and elections is demonstrably clear. From the appointment of sometimes unqualified and incompetent 
but financially endowed persons with positions to brazen corruption through the award of inflated procurement contracts, sometimes through sole sources, and diversion of state of resources to the few at the expense of the citizenry. Monetization of elections also affects the integrity and fairness of electoral process and outcomes that affects our quest for a truly sustainable and functional democracy. Social justice is very dear to my heart. It has been a common theme that runs through an overwhelming majority of my public speeches as national president of the GDA. There is good reason for that. One of utmost importance and very dear to me is the funding for an allocation for the running of the public school system cycles, especially at the basic level and general quality of education offered within our public school system. It is certain that people who attend Saito are from poor and deprived backgrounds. The clear abandonment of the Saito school reinforce the notion that our democratic experience under the First Republic is becoming one of elite freeloading. To invest in infrastructure in grade A senior high schools, where the children of the elite make up the highest intake, to the, determined, to the, to the detriment of investing in cycles can never be justified. The chasm that exists between our public basic schools and that of our public senior high schools should be a blot on our collective conscience as a nation. While I concede that the free SHS is very good and revolutionary, however, equal attention must be given to basic education at the public schools to ensure that they are not left behind. It is sad that many adolescent and teenage girls from poor rural communities cannot attend school during the period of their menstruation. This accounts for absenteeism during the PDC. Young girls cannot suffer because of biology. School attendance cannot be determined by the vagaries of the weather. Any time I travel across this country and I see young Saito people wearing tattered clothes, walking to school buildings that are best should be crowds for wearing cattle. When I see pictures of people sitting on the bare floor in ramshackle buildings, supposed to be classrooms. When I led a delegation of the GDA to Mepe to present educational items and saw the effects of the dam spillage on Saito education, I do not but feel sad as to how the political class and urban elite have become so insular and uncaring. These experiences led me to ask all male lawyers on Father's Day to make donations of sanitary parts to poor communities in every region, which was well received. It's my wish that it becomes part of... <laughs> it is my wish that it becomes part of the bad calendar even after my tenure ends. There is a need for us to take care for the vulnerable and sacrifice for the sake of our nation. We cannot live in urban areas and not think about the rural poor. Mr. President, the Ghana card should bridge this gap. It should not only be touted as a travel document that can be presented at airports. Airport travel in Ghana is largely a luxury and is an elite activity. The Ghana card could also be used to means test access to social intervention programs. We can help the poor without necessarily benefiting the rich. The free SHS program must be means tested using the data compiled by the National Identification Authority so that rich parents do not suddenly transform to become peasant farmers, as in the days of old when we had the Coco World Scholar. <laughs> Students from comfortable backgrounds who attended expensive basic schools must pay fees at the senior high school level so that resources are free to fully cater for the poor. Mr. President, we must invest more in Saito education, eliminate schools under trees, provide sanitary paths for poor young girls, first, before spending so much on secondary education. As one comes before two, so basic education comes before secondary education and ensures There is also this recent revelation about the school feeding program from the Auditor General, who should serve as a source of concern for us and call for review and improvements in the operations of the program, the main beneficiaries of which are from people from poor backgrounds. As a nation, our security is threatened when a chasm develops between the rich and the poor, the urban dweller and the rural dweller. The government, the DBA calls on the current government, the future ones, 
to implement policy standards to make public school education at the basic level both accessible to the poor and marginalized in our society while ensuring quality. In my opinion, the award of government scholarship should be only what it is, that is informed by real merit, economic and financial need of beneficiaries, especially those from poor backgrounds, and relevance to specific critical areas of study and research, especially when such critical areas of study and research, particularly in science, technology and research programs that are not offered by local universities. I find it immoral and troubling that government scholarships are given or awarded to persons with political connections and who are already from privileged and rich backgrounds at the expense of brilliance. At the expense of brilliant, by truly needy individuals and students. Recent reports have revealed corruption, sheer abuse, nepotism, and political patronage in the award of government scholarships in this country. It is equally unacceptable for multiple government scholarships to be given to an individual, while in some cases awardees take the scholarships and never attend the courses or programs while other Ghanaians who need a fraction of the amounts to study at local universities are denied and waste that way at home with all their skills and talents. It is equally unacceptable that scholarships in foreign currencies are awarded, awarded to people to study abroad when such programs or areas of study can be pursued at our local universities. We call for a review of how government scholarships are awarded or distributed in this country. It is recommended that legislation to streamline or regulate the distribution of scholarships in the country is enacted to deal with the challenges of government scholarships. Let me also add that about the need to ensure equitable development across the country to help curb the worsening rural urban threat. It is proper to refer to Article 36 d of the Constitution on the directive principles of state policy, the states. The state shall, in particular, take all necessary steps to establish a sound and healthy economy whose underlying principles shall include D, undertaking even and balanced development of all regions and every part of each region of Ghana, and in particular, improving the conditions of life in the rural areas and generally redressing any imbalance in development between the rural and the urban areas. Accordingly, the GBA retreats its call to the government and the state for that matter to take more effective and sustainable steps to ensure the realization of a much more fair and equitable development across the country and across the diverse sectors of the economy and sections of the populace, including more effective policy measures to tackle unemployment in all forms, especially among the youth, and bring real development to the people in the rural areas of our country thereby dealing with the rural urban drift. Ghana is more than Accra in Kumasi. <laughs> Let us also not forget in Hilas and wreaking havoc on our forests, water bodies, and the livelihoods of thousands of families whose farmlands and crops have been affected. Balance of or illegal mining is still a topical issue that deserves comment. The harmful effects of Galamsey are all around us. Last year, I mentioned a statement from the Pediatric Society of Ghana in which its president, Dr. John A. Apia, has established from their studies of how the Galamsey menace is contributing to deaths among children, as well as cognitive deficits which affect their school performance and suspected to cause congenital malformations. To make matters worse, the Ghana Water Company Limited in the central region recently released a statement dated 31st August 2024 with the heading, Water Supply Challenges Emanating from Illegal Mining Activities, in which it announced water supply challenges within Cape Coast, Elmina, and surrounding communities, resulting from a demand supply gap as a result of inadequate raw water received at the Sechrehimain Water Treatment Plant as a result of Kalamsi. And there are several stories like this reported in the media about the raging menace of illegal mining. On 2nd September 2024, my joint online also reported that the Ghana Water Company Ashanti region has forewarned that residents in Ogwaset and adjoining communities face a looming water shortage 
as illegal mining activities continue to ravage water bodies in the area due to the pollution of the Otaso River. Similar stories have been reported in other regions. There are fears that Ghana will be facing a water crisis soon to re and soon require importation of drinking water. Some recent reported visits by some popular journalists in Ghana to some of our major rivers with accompanying pictorial and video evidence show that these major rivers across the country have been polluted, showing impunity and lawlessness of those actively destroying our lands and rivers and their equally shameless financiers. Despite the efforts and assurance of government to deal with the menace, there appears to be a consensus that not much has been done to effectively eradicate the human. To be blunt, things are getting worse. As an issue which poses an existential threat to our nation so severe that His Excellency the President put his presidency on the line, unfortunately, has degenerated, degenerated into a political football match between the major political parties as to who polluted the water the most. <laughs> It was quite shocking and most regrettable when a member of the leadership of parliament on the floor of parliament stated that the minority party during this period in government polluted the waters of Ghana more than the ruling party. Such a responsible statement by a member of parliament is symptomatic of the malaise affecting our dear nation. Every issue must be re reduced to partisan point story while our nation please drive. It reveals an uncurrent political elite only interested in holding lofty positions in government. The anecdotal, <laughs> the anecdotal evidence that Galamse is controlled by powerful interests in Ghana cannot be ignored. The state must be honest and deal with the real powers behind this menace. We cannot deal with that mistake by organizing public fora and making noise on our airways. We will play in the ostrich without future if we pretend as we are now. The government must be honest and bold and fish out this evil asset of powerful interests. <laughs> Engage in a wanton destruction of our environment and deal with them decisively, irrespective of the status of the individuals involved. I also wish to add us to this circumspect and civil in some of the things we say about judges and their judgments. So it's because you do not like a decision or judgment delivered by a judge, especially because it is politically inconvenient, does not mean the judge was wrong or that the judge had acted improperly. The court and judges give decisions based on what the law is and not based on how a party or even some section of the people like it to be. It becomes even more troubling and embarrassing when the comments and attacks are made by lawyers, who as officers of the court must and ought to know better. It is even more scandalous and reprehensible in clear cases of lawyers belonging to political parties become disingenuous and mislead the public on decisions of court, contrary to what they know the law is, just to make their political party look good. It is dangerous and confuses the unlearned public. The GBA condemns in no uncertain terms partisan attacks on the legal profession and the judiciary, and we shall resist all attempts to foment disaffection against the judiciary and the legal profession. <laughs> These are very challenging times for our profession. With my close to 30 years on the bar, I can say with certainty that things have changed, the dynamics have changed. We must be a bar that meets the needs of its ever-growing membership. Suffice to say that demography at the bar has changed considerably, and change is inevitable if we must survive. I also wish to encourage us to be diligent, discharge our duties with professionalism and integrity. Whatever has been said about integrity as part of public offices equally applies to us, no matter where we offer professional services and competences. 
whether in private practice or in public speaking. It is sometimes very difficult to hear some lawyers say or publish, very difficult to hear what some lawyers say or publish, when some lawyers say or publish bad and unpleasant things about the GBA and its executives, as well as the very profession from which they earn a living just to defend the cause of their political parties. How many times have we not been told and cautioned not to cut our noses just to spite our fine faces? As a son of a redound politician, I know what it takes to be a member of a political party, and I have never understood how membership of a political party will be of more importance to a lawyer than being a member of the most noble profession. <laughs> that is why it is completely unacceptable for a lawyer appearing as a member of the communication team of a political party to declare on national television that the leadership of the Ghana Bar Association is the most useless in Ghana. And no lawyer from her political tradition advised her to withdraw such a statement. Such attacks do not affect the leadership in, e in either their individual and collective capacities, but the very legal profession that gives you a name and a source of livelihood. I accept that as an association as such as ours, with all its attendant diabetes, we shall have different opinions and notions of propriety. However, I believe that we can have and adopt a much healthier way to ventilate our differences and opinions within the bounds of respect and civility. At this conference, we'll be discussing the future of the bar. And I implore members to take time, take time. I know that there are some beautiful bantaman girls that can distract you, but please take time. <laughs> Especially to our junior lawyers, take time. For us to collectively share ideas on the way forward for the GB. Anyone with views or grievances about the assembly and how things are done is encouraged to voice them out. That is better than write letters written for publication in various media outlets that paint a bad picture of us. The issue of conference funding will be discussed. The time has come for us to be innovative yet realistic about conference funding. We must adopt international best practices in this regard. The Council will propose for our consideration a basic request conference registration fee for all members, and all other services such as meals, medical examination, evening events, dinners, etc., will be standalone items, specifically costed, so members can make their individual choices. The GBA must place on record the Ontario efforts of Professor Rewont Akumbro Atuguba, Dean of the University of Ghana School of Law, and Justice Barry Maya of Hong Kong here in helping develop excellent legal education. Professor, <laughs> Professor Atububa is spearheading efforts to build a magnificent building defeating our premier law school. And I charge every lawyer in Ghana to contribute to ensure a timely completion of the project. We should make it our own. Whether you are an alumnus of UG, SOL or not, the inescapable fact is that the history of our profession can never be written without the invaluable contribution of the University of Ghana to the development of law in this country. <laughs> Justice Very Maya of Paul Kodye, our Director of Ghana, Director of Legal Education, is at the forefront of expanding access to professional legal education and need our support, especially in finding permanent structures to house the commercial campus of the Ghana School of Law. I have found it necessary to call the former president of the United States, John F. Kennedy. In one of his famous speeches, comments on that we, go, we chose to go to the moon, stated that we chose to go to the moon. We chose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which is intended to win others too. This statement equally applies to Ghana and our choice of democracy and constitutional rule. After many years of military adventurism and autocratic rule, in 1992, we the people of Ghana chose the path of constitutional rule and democracy under the ages of the 1992 constitution through a referendum. When we chose democracy and constitutional rule, it was not because it was easy and convenient, but because it is hard, because it is challenging, but one that was necessary to provide the most decent and enduring way and environment to mobilize and galvanize our collective efforts, skills,
hopes and talents into one whole and continuum that will propel us to achieve our collective aspirations. Aspirations of unity, socio-economic development, prosperity, national security and equal opportunities for all. 30 years down the line, we continue our march on wavering in our quest for sustainable democracy, even if not perfect. Democratic and constitutional rule cannot be perfect by any means. However, let us take solace from the more recent dark periods of our political history and the reasonable strides we have made. Mr. Churchill may have said that democracy is the worst form of government. However, he was quick to acknowledge that it was still superior to all forms of government ever tried by man. In Ghana, we tried military adventures and autocratic rule. We know which is better. As a popular account proverb goes, Yasuan Fu, Aswansa, Yehudi Mudru. I urge all of us to play our part, to do our best no matter which trade or profession we find ourselves, with a promise and commitment to help achieve a sustainable democracy in Ghana, which rise above partisanship. Let us show that despite our cultural, political and religious differences, we are one people with a common destiny, a common desire and purpose to build a democratic nation that works for all of us. Let me make a humble call to all Ghanaians of all walks of life in whatever endeavor we find ourselves, in and across the political and social strata, to be more patriotic and national cause, we ask Ghanaians to exhibit a renewed and stronger spirit of patriotism. We should strive to be excellent and extremely bureaucratic. I believe in elitism. I believe that elitism achieves through equal opportunity, hard work and perseverance, and not perpetrated through accident of faith. For as the greatest English judge ever, Lord Alfred Thompson Dennis once remarked, I am on the liberal or progressive side. I believe in equal opportunity, and as an old grammar school boy, I believe in independence too. I believe in an elite of excellence, certainly not an elite of the upper class. I would be against that. To my cherished members of the bar, I'm beside myself with mixed devotion that this day offers. With a mixture of my pride as president of bar, the gratitude of service, the humility of stewardship, and the reality of this being my last time opening address the conference as president. This day is a momentous one. Let me place on record that it has been a challenging but worthwhile and fulfilling journey so far. From the very first day of my term in office, I hit the ground running, aware of the expectations of me and the various challenges facing our profession within the context of the provinces in my manifesto. By God's grace and the support of the other members of the Executive and Bar Council, as well as with your cooperation, I believe I've been able to deliver on most of the thematic areas in my manifesto. Now, I say a big thank you to my parents for not giving up on their most troublesome son, especially my father for his guidance and protection. To my permanent petition under the Matrimonial Causes Act, otherwise known as Mrs. Irene Kwa, for, take, for taking care of our young children because of my prolonged absence from home. To, my, to the members of the National Executive Committee for their dedication and support, and for keeping our disagreements behind those doors, those major disagreements. For members of the General Council of the Bar for their unwavering support, especially my big brother Amwaka Foku, who loves me so much that in his presence I feel like a pampered Gusa Royal. To our distinguished past presidents for their invaluable advice to deliver to me in private. To Chief Justice Eni Yebua for teaching me the value of humility while also in an office of prestige and honor. To Efo J.V.R. Wilson and the wonderful staff at National Secretariat, the late Peter Davis, Eric Kamodena, and Jerry, who has a ready solution to every problem. Roxon, and my personal yaru, the annoying but yet loyal state in Naba. If there is anything I will miss as GBA president, it's walking to the reception of the National Secretariat and being greeted by the staff, especially Roxas, with his daily salutation, boss, divine selection of fire in the <laughs> To Anthony Fossin Jr., the IPP for our special professional relationship that has made many good things for the GBA. To the ever dependable Susanna Nyampo. To my insiders, Peter Dazi, Paul Cesar Kui, Chris Oseyebua, and Sabo Kofi Nati. To the ones who engage in treasury, I say a very big thank you, for your treasury made me strong. Just before the whole conference, I had come to my wit's end because of what I considered too much treasury, and I took an impulsive decision to resign without discussing with anyone. I go to the National Secretariat to draft my recognition letter. As usual, the reliably unreliable statement forgot to close the door to my office. And as I sat in my office with tears flowing down my eyes, a gentleman walked into my office. He asked me why I was crying. I told him I was leaving. He replied, 
Do not think your enemies will leave you if you resign. <laughs> Chief Justice and spouse. Ochufua <laughs> Santehene. Members of the Council of State, the Shanti Regional Minister, the first Deputy Speaker of Parliament and Member of Parliament for the Choir, Vice Chancellor of the University, Attorney General, Deputy Attorneys General. Justices of the Supreme Court, active and retired, and other justices of the Superior Court of Judicature, judges, members of the Judicial Council, Judicial Secretary, members of the General Legal Council, President and members of the Bar Council of the Ghana Bar Association, members of the Ghana Bar Association, Heads of National and Regional Security Services, the Kumasi Metropolitan Chief Executive of the Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly and other MMDCs, Nananun, members of the Diplomatic Corps, fellow Ghanaians, ladies and gentlemen. This is an emotional occasion for me addressing for the eighth and final time this august gathering in my capacity as President of the Republic. And I thank you so much for the award you have generously conferred on me. It is one that I will cherish for the lifetime. Thank you very much. It is also deeply significant because of my long-standing association with the Ghana Bar Association. So I hope you'll forgive me if I take some time today. <laughs> the highest office of the land began within the confines of the legal profession. I'm a proud product of this noble profession, and it is here amongst you that I've always felt most at home. The values of justice, equity, and the rule of law that we cherish as lawyers have been the guiding principles of my public life. The Ghana Bar Association has played a central role in shaping not just my career, but also my world view, what the Germans call Weltenschein. As a young lawyer, freshly called to the bar, I was imbued with the belief that the law is a powerful tool for social change. This belief has underpinned my career as a lawyer, as an advocate for human rights, and eventually as a politician. In the early years of my practice at the bar, in the mid-1970s, after five years of international corporate law practice in Paris with an American law firm, I had the privilege of working alongside some of the finest legal minds this country has ever produced. Having unexpectedly inherited the chambers of the eminent Jamaican barrister and one of the leaders of the bar, U.V. Campbell, within three months of joining his practice as a junior, when he decided to return to his native Jamaica to become a judge of our Supreme Court, I was thrown as a Nino barrister into the deep ends of the pool, having to learn to swim against acknowledged leaders of the bar, R.S. Blay, Joe Randolph, B.J. Darocha, Peter Ala Ajete, T.A. Toto, Peter Swanaka, Charles Hay from Benjamin, Norbert Kujau, J.K. Ajina, 
Samuel Kujatu, amongst others. UV Campbell was either, was counsel either for the plaintiff or for the defendant in a series of important cases involving on the opposite side one or other of these great advocates. I had without any preparation to step into his large shoes. It was an exhilarating experience for I learned the importance of integrity, the necessity of diligence, and the power of advocacy. It was during this time that I also became acutely aware of the role that lawyers play in the defense of democracy and the rule of law. My involvement in the seminal legal battles of the 1980s and 90s, particularly during the dark days of military rule, further solidified my dedication to the principles of the rule of law and democracy. The Ghana Bar Association, during those turbulent times, stood as a bastion of resistance to authoritarian rule. We were the voice of the voiceless, the defenders of the oppressed, and the guardians of the rule of law. They, those were challenging times, but they were also times that tested and reaffirmed our resolve to the ideals of democracy. As a lawyer, I had the honor of representing clients from all walks of life, those who had been wronged by the state, those who saw justice in a system that often seemed stacked against them, and those who simply needed someone to stand up for their rights. It was in the courtrooms that I honed my skills as an advocate, but more importantly, it was there that I deepened my understanding of the critical role that the law plays in safeguarding our freedoms. When I transitioned into politics, it was the same zeal for justice and democracy that I carried from the courtroom. My legal background has always informed my approach to governance. I have sought to bring the discipline, rigor, and fairness of the legal profession into public service. As president, I've worked to ensure that the principles of justice, transparency, and accountability are not just mere words, but are in fact embedded in the fabric of our governance structures. As I prepare to hand over the reins of national leadership, it is appropriate time to reflect on the journey we have traveled together over the past seven and a half years. My presidency in many ways has been an extension of my legal career, a continuation of my devotion to the rule of law and the protection of the rights of all Ghanaians. One of my first acts as president was to ensure the independence of the judiciary. A strong independent judiciary is the cornerstone of any democracy. It is the institution that Ghanaians turn to in times of dispute and it should be above reproach. During my tenure, we have worked tirelessly to strengthen the judiciary, ensuring that it has the resources, the independence, and the integrity to fulfill its mandate. We've introduced electronic filing systems, reducing reliance on paper-based documentation, and streamlining the judicial process. This initiative has not only expedited the handling of cases, but has also enhanced transparency and accountability within the legal system. Lawyers and litigants can now file their documentation online, access case information, and receive updates on their cases in real time. This is a major leap forward in making justice more acceptable, accessible, and efficient for all Ghanaians. The establishment of a permanent modern court of appeal, complex in Kumasi, should help improve justice delivery for the northern sector of the country. With the collaboration of the Ministry of Local Government, Decentralization and Rural Development and the District Assembly Common Fund, 20 townhouses 
and the guest house have been built to be used as permanent, permanent residences for justice of the Court of Appeal based in Kumasi, who are mandated to handle cases in the northern parts of the country. It should mean that appeals from the Upper West, Upper East, Savannah, North East, Northern, Ahafo, Bono, Bono East, Western North, and the Shanty regions should now be conveniently held within a much shorter period. Additionally, in 2020, we set out to construct 100 courthouses with residential facilities nationwide. As of February 2024, 79 courthouses have been successfully inaugurated and are in use at different sites around the country. The remaining 21 projects are at various stages of completion and are expected to be completed and inaugurated this year. In addition, over 121 residential units have been constructed for judges throughout the country. The project is not yet complete, but I can safely say that we've done enough to address the perennial problem of insufficient court infrastructure in Ghana. We've also taken strong systemic steps to combat corruption, rooted in a holistic program of legislative, administrative, financial, and technological reforms. We've established the Office of the Special Prosecutor, a critical institution in the fight against corruption, and we've provided it with the necessary tools to prosecute those who seek to enrich themselves at the expense of the Ghanaian people. During my first term in office, Parliament passed the Witness Protection Act in 2018, which I signed in law to create a witness protection scheme for individuals cooperating with law enforcement, especially in corruption cases. The Critical Offenses Amendment Act of 2020 elevated corruption from a misdemeanor to a felony with harsher sentences of 12 to 25 years in prison. In addition, my administration has driven the passage of several key laws that bolster the state's ability to fight corruption. These include the Revenue Administration Amendment Act, the Fiscal Responsibility Act, and Anti-Money Laundering Act, amongst others. Together, these legal reforms have strengthened the institutional framework to combat corruption and ensure accountability. Administratively, a series of other far-reaching measures have been undertaken by my government to help in the fight against corruption. A memorandum of understanding on information exchange and collaboration in combating corruption and crime in general has been signed by Shraj, Iyoko, Parliament, the Office of the Attorney General, the Audit Service, the Police Service, the Financial Intelligence Center, the Narcotics Control Commission, the Internal Audit Agency, the National Investigation Bureau, NIB, and the Office of the Special Prosecutor to this end. The use of technology has been pivotal in our efforts to combat corruption. We have introduced digital platforms for public procurement processes, reducing human intervention, and, and minimizing the opportunities for corrupt practices. These platforms have increased transparency, efficiency, and competitiveness in public procurement, ensuring that public resources are used judiciously for the benefit of all Ghanaians. The Auditor General's report for 2023, for example, revealed a significant decline in financial irregularities within the public sector, dropping by 5.2 billion CDs from the previous year, a 32% reduction. Furthermore, we have worked to reform our legal and regulatory framework to enhance transparency and accountability. We have strengthened the right to information, ensuring that Ghanaians have the tools they need to hold their government accountable. The passage of the Right to Information Act 
which preceding administrations had failed to accomplish, was an important milestone in this regard, providing citizens with the power to demand a transparency for their leaders. By the same token, the Conduct of Public Officers Bill has passed the scrutiny of the Cabinet Committee on Governance and is now ready for presentation to the full Cabinet, after which it will be presented to Parliament for its action. I'm extremely hopeful that this will be accomplished before I leave office. It is also an undeniable fact that budgetary allocations for institutions actively engaged in public sector accountability, that is the Office of the Auditor General, the Judiciary, Parliament, the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Shraj, the Ghana Police Service, the Economic and Organized Crimes Office, EYOKO, and the Financial Intelligence Center have all witnessed unprecedented increases since I assumed office in 2017. At the end of 2023, the budgetary allocation to partners to Parliament witnessed a 100% increase compared to what I inherited in 2016. The police service saw its budget increase by 274% at the end of 2023 in comparison to 2016. The audit service recorded a 258% rise in its budgetary allocation at the end of 2023 as compared to 2016. The budget of the judiciary rose by 36% at the end of 2023 compared to 2016. The budget of the Attorney General, of the Office of the Attorney General, increased by 162% at the end of 2023 compared to 2016. The budget of the Yoko increased by 47% at the end of 2023 in comparison to 2016. The budget of the Financial Intelligence Center increased by 443% at the end of 2023 compared to 2026, 2016. Whilst the budget of Shraj increased by 99% at the end of 2023 compared to 2016. These figures reflect my resolve to ensure that institutions of state of relevance in the anti-corruption agenda are properly equipped to discharge satisfaction the mandate of their offices. I'm aware that there's a deliberate, politically motivated effort to stigmatize my government, my family, and myself as corrupt. I suspect, as payback for the damaging allegations of corruption leveled against members of the Eswa Mahama administration, some of which have led to criminal convictions and others are still being prosecuted in court. In spite of scrutiny by credible public institutions of virtually all these allegations of misconduct on the part of my government, my family, and myself, which have been found to be baseless, the leader of the opposition, the perennial NDC presidential candidate, continues to describe me as a clearing agent. It is important that I, re I, will, I reiterate that I will not abandon under any circumstance recourse to due process in the fight against corruption. Be that as it may, in any event, I will leave it to the Ghanaian public and people. I will leave it to the judgment of the Ghanaian public and people decide to decide whether it is preferable to be a clearing agent or government official one. <laughs> our commitment to the rule of law has also been evident in our approach to law enforcement. We have worked to ensure that our security agencies operate within the confines of the law, respecting the rights of all citizens, human rights abuses, 
which were all too common in our parts, have no place in the democratic Ghana. We have established mechanisms to ensure that those who abuse their power are held accountable. In the international arena, we have also sought to uphold the rule of law and champion democratic values. Ghana's voice has been strong in defending international law and human rights and advocating for democracy on the global stage. We have worked closely with our neighbors and the international community to advance peace and security, recognizing that a stable and democratic West Africa is essential for our own national security. As we gather here today to discuss the theme, peaceful, fair, and transparent elections, the key to sustainable democracy, it is essential to reflect on our nation's historical journey, particularly our past experience with military rule. Ghana's post-independence history has been marked by several military interventions in the governance of the state. The first of these occurred in 1966, when the one-party government of our first president, Kwame Nkrumah, was overthrown in a coup d'etat. This event set the stage for a series of military takeovers that would dominate Ghana's political landscape for the next three decades. Each of these regimes came to power with premises of restoring order, combating corruption, and revitalizing the economy. However, as history has shown, military rule often led to the opposite outcomes. The suspension of constitutional governments, the erosion of civil liberties, and the concentration of power in the hands of a few were the hallmarks of these regimes. Under military rule, Due process was set aside in favor of decrees and edicts. The judiciary was emasculated and the legal profession was marginalized. The Ghana Bar Association during these times found itself at odds with the military authorities as it sought to defend the rights of citizens and uphold the principles of the rule of law. Some of our colleagues paid a high price for their loyalty to these principles. Some were detained, others were exiled, and a few even lost their lives in the struggle for democracy and the defense of the rule of law. And may their souls continue to rest in perfect peace. The economic impact of military rule was equally devastating. The lack of accountability and the culture of impunity that characterized these re regimes led to widespread corruption and, and mismanagement. Our economy, once the envy of the continent, was brought to its knees. Infrastructure deteriorated. Basic services became surplus, and the standard of living for the average Ghanaian plummeted. But perhaps the most profound consequence of military rule was the loss of trust in our institutions. The courts, the media, civil society, and the political class were all viewed with suspicion. The erosion of trust had long-standing effects, making the task of nation building even more challenging when democracy was finally restored. I have dwelt on these matters because I'm aware that a new generation of Ghanaians has emerged who are now politically active and who have little or no direct knowledge of these events and who may be thus susceptible to the siren calls of those who would want to return us to those unfortunate, unproductive days. There will always be anti-democrats, those few who do not trust the capacity of ordinary people to make good decisions. There will always be those few who seek a shortcut to the exercise of executive power. People who are unwilling to do the hard work of popular mobilization and messaging required of democratic politics, but who nonetheless want to exercise executive power. It is to the eternal credit of the Ghanaian people 
that they continue to resist the blandishments of these so-called progressive politicians to embark on adventures that will set back the clock of progress. The return to democratic governance in 1993 has become a watershed moment in our nation's history. It marked the beginning of the Fourth Republic and a renewed attachment to constitutional government, the rule of law, and respect for individual liberties and human rights. The transition to democracy was not without its challenges, but it was driven by the collective will of the Ghanaian people to chart a new course for the nation. The Fourth Republican Constitution, promulgated in 1993, laid the foundation for the democratic governance we enjoy today. It established a system of checks and balances based on the separation of powers. It guaranteed fundamental human rights, and it provided for regular, free, and fair elections. The Constitution also enshrined the independence of the judiciary, affirming it as the exclusive final arbiter in disputes and the protector of the rights of citizens. Several of the safeguards in the Constitution, i.e., entrenching the multi-party structure of the state by outlawing in Article 3 the power of Parliament to establish a one-party state, or consolidating judicial independence by excluding in Article 125 Clause 3 the grant of final judicial power to either the President or Parliament were direct responses to unhappy episodes of our past, especially in the First Republic. We know the damage to the stability of the state and to the liberties of citizens that the passage of the infamous Preventive Detention Act wrought in the immediate post-independence era. Just as we witnessed in the same era, in violation of the principle of the separation of powers, the ugly spectacle of a tightly controlled parliament acting at the instigation of the executive to in emergency session to nullify or reverse judgments of courts of competent jurisdiction for purely partisan political considerations. Since the return to democratic governance, Ghana has made impressive strides. We have conducted eight successful general elections, each of which has served as a reaffirmation of our adherence to democracy. These elections, while not without their ch challenges, have been generally credible. The peaceful transfer of power from one administration to another, from one political party to another, has become a hallmark of Ghana's democracy. The Fourth Republic has afforded the most enduring period of stable constitutional rule in our hitherto turbulent history. The benefits of democratic governance to the Ghanaian people have been numerous. It has provided a framework for political stability, which in turn has created an environment conducive to economic growth and development. Under democratic rule, Ghana has seen improvements in its education, her education, health care, infrastructure, and other critical sectors. Real incomes have systematically increased the expansion of the middle class, the growth of civil society, and the strengthening of our institutions are all testaments to the progress we have made. Democracy has also allowed for greater political participation and representation. The voices of women, youth, and marginal groups, which were often silenced during the years of military rule, are now heard loud and clear. Our parliament, is more representative, our media is more vibrant, and civil society is more engaged than ever. These are the traits of a healthy democracy, one where diverse views are held, where differing opinions are respected, and where the will of the people is paramount. As we approach yet another election cycle, it is crucial that we reflect on the importance of 
peaceful, fair, and transparent elections to the sustainability of our democracy. Elections are not merely a democratic ritual. They are the very lifeblood of our political system. They are the mechanisms through which the people exercise their sovereign will, choose their leaders, and hold them accountable. For elections to fulfill this role, they should be conducted in a manner that is free from violence, manipulation, and fraud. The integrity of the electoral system is the foundation upon which the legitimacy of government rests. When elections are conducted fairly and transparently, the results accepted are accepted by all, even generally by the losers. This broad acceptance is essential for peace, stability, and the continued progress of the nation. However, the history of the African continent is replete with examples of elections that have gone awry. Elections marked by violence, by irregularities, and by a lack of transparency. Such elections have led to disputed results, political instability, and in some cases, open conflict. We should learn from these experiences and ensure that Ghana does not ever fall into the same trap. To this end, it is essential that all stakeholders in the electoral process, political parties, the Electoral Commission, the security agencies, civil society, the media, and the citizenry, pledge to upholding the highest standards of integrity. The Kufuado government on this part will do everything within its power to ensure that the upcoming elections are conducted in an environment of peace, fairness, and transparency. <laughs> the Electoral Commission, as the body charged with overseeing the electoral process, has a critical role to play. It should act with impartiality, independence, and integrity, ensuring that the process is fair to all parties and that the results reflect the true will of the people. The Commission should also ensure that all logistical arrangements are in place to facilitate a smooth voting process and that any disputes that arise are handled expeditiously and transparently. It is imperative that the Electoral Commission remains the sole authority responsible for declaring ele election results to preserve the integrity and credibility of the electoral process. Political parties must refrain from declaring results before the Electoral Commission does so, as this could lead to confusion, misinformation, and even potential conflict. The EC's role as an impartial and independent body ensures that its results reflect the will of the people, free from partisan influence. This assignment of responsibility is essential to maintain public trust in the electoral system and to prevent any undermining of democracy through the spread of unverified or false election outcomes. Despite assurances from successive electoral commissioners, such as Kojo Afarijan, my three-year roommate is an undergraduate at the University of Ghana's Premier Hall, Nigon Hall, Charlotte Osei, and the current one, Jean Mensah, that rigging elections in Ghana is not possible. A few claim that the only way the NPP can win the December 24 elections is through rigging. It is becoming evident that these voices are already preparing excuses for the increasingly likely outcome of the impending elections. The constant, persistent champion in Ghana's history of the values of multi-party democracy, rigging is not part of the MPP's DNA. The MPP's path to victory is through a robust defense of its exceptional proven track record in office and the compelling vision of continuing modernization of Ghana's future being espoused 
by the party's excellent presidential candidate, the Vice President Dr. Muhammadu Baumia, and his dynamic running mate, the Honorable Dr. Matthew Poku Prempe, Member of Parliament for Manchester South, known to all and sundry here in Kumasi as Napo. The security agencies also have a crucial role in maintaining law and order during the election period. Their presence should be felt, but it also should be measured and appropriate. That they should ensure that they act within the confines of the law, protecting the rights of all citizens, while preventing any form of violence or intimidation by enforcing strictly the law against vigilantism. Civil society organizations, the media, and citizens themselves should also play their part. Civil society should continue to work in educating the public, monitoring the electoral process, and advocating for transparency and accountability. The media should report on the elections fairly and accurately, providing the public with the information they need to make informed decisions, and the citizens of Ghana, the ultimate decision makers of our democracy, should exercise their right to vote responsibly and peacefully. As an arbiter of electoral disputes has an indispensable role in safeguarding the integrity of elections. The independence, impartiality, and credibility of the judiciary are fundamental to ensuring that electoral disputes are resolved justly and without bias. In recent years, the judiciary has been tested in that regard, and I'm proud to say that it has risen to the occasion. The courts have handled election petitions with the seriousness and thoroughness that such cases demand. The decisions of our courts, whether they have upheld or overturned election results, have been based on the evidence presented and the law, not on political pressure or influence. And that is as it should be. As we move towards another election, I urge the judiciary to continue to uphold these high standards. The court should remain a place where all citizens, regardless of their political affiliation, can seek redress with confidence that their cases will be heard fairly and impartially. The judiciary should also ensure that its processes are transparent, that its reasons its rulings are well reasoned, and that justice is not only done, but is also seen to be done. The integrity of our democracy depends in large part on the integrity of our judiciary. A strong, independent judiciary is the ultimate safeguard against the, against the subversion of the will of the people. It is the institution that ensures that our elections are not just a facade, but a true reflection of the democratic process. Now, friends, ladies and gentlemen, democracy is more than just a system of government. It is a way of life. It requires active and informed participation by citizens, respect for the rule of law, and love for the common good. To sustain our democracy, we should continue to invest in civic education and promote a culture of political tolerance. Civic education is essential for empowering citizens to participate meaningfully in the democratic process. It equips them with the knowledge of their rights and responsibilities, the workings of government, and the importance of their vote. Civic education fosters a sense of ownership and responsibility among citizens, encouraging them to engage actively in the governance of their country. Political tolerance is another essential pillar of a sustainable democracy. In a diverse society like ours, it is natural that there will be differing opinions and competing political interests. This diversity is a strength, not a weakness. It is through the contestation of ideas that we arrive at the best solutions for our country. However, Political tolerance requires that we respect the rights of others to hold and express views that may di differ from our own. It requires that we engage in constructive dialogue 
rather than resulting to violence or intimidation. It requires that we see our political opponents not as enemies, but as fellow citizens who share the same goal of building a brighter Ghana, even if we just differ on how to achieve it. Political tolerance, however, cannot extend to the unfortunate specter of public threats and utterances of violence, which should more properly be the target of the law enforcement agencies as unacceptable conduct and behavior. As leaders, we should set the example. We should engage in respectful discourse, avoid inflammatory rhetoric, and work to create an environment where all citizens feel free to express their views without fear of retribution. Only by advancing a culture of political tolerance can we ensure that our democracy remains vibrant and inclusive. In this political season, it is vital that we guard against the politics of lies, disinformation, and misinformation, as these undermine the democratic process and erode public trust. The spread of propaganda and falsehoods can mislead voters distort the truth, and create unnecessary tension within the body politic. Political actors, the media and citizens alike, have a shared responsibility to ensure that information disseminated is accurate, verified, and truthful. By committing to trans transparency and integrity in all communications, we can safeguard the electoral process from the damaging effects of misinformation and disinformation, and ensure that decisions are made based on facts rather than fabrications. Failing to do so risks polarizing the electorate and destabilizing the very foundations of our democracy. Before I conclude, I must point out that as members of the bar, we carry the heavy responsibility of ensuring that the public is accurately informed about legal matters. This responsibility is not just about explaining the law, but it is also about shaping public perception and understanding of the justice system. In a society where misinformation can easily spread, it is critical that the bar acts as a reliable source of information regarding guiding the public in comprehending complex legal issues. It is with respect responsible for officials of the Bar Association to give the impression to the public that the use of the word perverse by no less an official than the Attorney General and official leader of the Bar to describe the judgment of a court is somehow reprehensible. The author of such a view betrays complete ignorance of the language of practice in the courts. It is a perfectly acceptable, hallowed use of language so to designate certain decisions of the court. For instance, decisions that can also be properly characterized as given per inquiria. I myself, as Attorney General, use the same vocabulary to describe the decision of the ordinary bench of the Supreme Court in 2002 in the now celebrated Chachuchikata Fast Track Court case, which is full bench of the court, ultimately validated on review. In the same vein, let me stress that the Ghanaian judicial system, unlike its American counterpart, with which some seek to draw comparisons, operates with distinct mechanisms, particularly in the appointment and tenure of judges. For instance, while U.S. Supreme Court judges are appointed for life, Ghana's system prescribes time limits to judicial appointments, ensuring that our judiciary remains adaptive and attuned to the current needs of our nation. The recent proposal by the Chief Justice to appoint additional judges to the Supreme Court, which some have criticized, was a necessary and well-considered action to maintain the strength and efficiency of the judiciary. It is important to note that even in the United States, President Joe Biden has recognized the need for judicial reform, 
proposing changes to the Supreme Court to ensure it remains effective and reflective of modern values. This global perspective highlights that judicial appointments and reforms are essential aspects of maintaining a just and functioning legal system. The Ghana Bar Association should take the lead in educating the public, clarifying these issues, and reinforcing trust in our legal institutions. Furthermore, the jurisdiction of the American Supreme Court and of our own are widely dissimilar. The Ghanaian Supreme Court has a greater and much broader jurisdiction than its American counterpart. And by virtue of express constitutional fiat, is duty bound to take all appeals and other applications to its various jurisdictions. And is precluded from relying on the well-known instrument of social order by which the US Supreme Court controls all applications to the invocation of its authority. The US Supreme Court sitting on top of an extensive federal judicial structure, which comprises 50 state Supreme Courts, coexisting with federal district courts and the federal court of appeal. Out of 7,000 applications to the exercise of this jurisdiction, relies on its certiorari procedure to admit only 150 cases for hearing each year in a population of more than 300 million people. In Ghana, a country with a population of some 33 million people, the Supreme Court began the 2022-2023 legal year with 414 cases pending as of July 2022. Throughout the year, a total of 525 new cases were filed underscoring the continuing demands on the court's resources. Although 345 cases were concluded by the end of the period, the backlog grew with 595 cases unresolved as of June 2023. This data highlights the increasing pressure on the Supreme Court as the number of pen pending cases continues to rise despite ongoing efforts to manage and resolve them. It is clear that facile, ill-informed comparisons do not serve the public interest. We would all do better to consider the Chief Justice's proposal on its merits and leave spurious notions of court packing alone. By the sheer coincidence of history, I have been given the privilege and opportunity to appoint three Chief Justices, together with 18 other judges of the Supreme Court, a number which stands currently at 13 judges of the present court. Indeed, only Justices Bafo Bonny and Gabriel Scotty Poirman were appointed by predecessor presidents. If court packing was my goal, it surely, it surely would have been completed and realized by now. That is not and has never been my goal. My goal has been to fill the court with the best material available within the profession. And in all modesty, I believe I have succeeded in doing so. It was the same when I was Attorney General. Justices Datiba, Modibo Okran, and A.P. Kluge well, all appointments proposed by me to my, my boss, the outstanding Ghanaian statesman, His Excellency John Adjikun Kufour, the second president of the Fourth Republic. All these judges left strong imprints of judicial creativity. Members of the bar, as I could prepare to leave office, I do so with a deep sense of optimism about the future of Ghana's democracy. We have traveled a long and sometimes difficult road, but we have made considerable progress. Our democracy is stronger, our institutions are more resilient, and our people are more determined than ever to build a nation that is free, just, progressive, prosperous, and united. The upcoming elections will be another test of our attachment to the values of democracy. 
It is my fervent hope and prayer that we will pass this test with flying colors. Let us approach these elections with the seriousness and sense of responsibility that they deserve. Let us conduct ourselves in a manner that brings honor to our nation and reinforces our allegiance to democracy. In the years to come, the challenges we face will undoubtedly evolve, but so too will be opportunities. Ghana remains a beacon of democracy and stability and development on the African continent. And if we are to continue to maintain this status, we should remain steadfast in our obligation to the rule of law, to the protection of human rights, and to the principles of democratic accountability. In conclusion, I'd like to express my profound gratitude to the Ghana Bar Association for its strong continuing support of the rule of law and the tenets of democracy. Its role in helping to shape the future of our nation is indispensable. As I prepare to hand over the baton of national leadership, I do so with confidence that the future of Ghana is bright and that our democracy will continue to thrive. And in so saying, let me express before I sit down my difference with the president of the bar on one critical issue. People who can afford to pay fees for the education of their wards should send them to fee-paying private schools. Public schools, public schools, that is schools funded by the taxpayer, should be free to all who would otherwise be unable to pay for their education. That is why the numbers of pupils who have access to secondary education has doubled since the introduction of the free senior high school policy. <laughs> and that over 5.7 million persons have benefited from the policy since its inception. The full impact of this dramatic development will be felt in due course and will far outweigh the small number of privileged parents who can afford to pay for the education of their wards. <clears throat> now, friends, members of the bar, let us continue to work together to build a Ghana that is free, just, peaceful, and prosperous. Let us ensure that our democracy endures for generations and generations to come, and that it remains a source of pride for all Ghanaians. I end by congratulating the outgoing executive of the bar, who have worked hard these last three years, and wishing the incoming executive, who will be elected at this conference, the best of luck and God's blessings on the discharge of its important duties. May God bless the Ghana Bar Association. And that's all. And may God bless our homeland Ghana and make her great and strong. I thank you for your attention.